Where were you when the wheel was invented in the fourth millennium BC? And where were you when the Wright brothers achieved their first powered flight in 1903? The original Kitty Hawk moment where everybody understood we can fly. Of course, you'll never be asked those questions. You're way too young, of course. We all are. But you might be asked a different question. Because now we are at the verge of a fundamental breakthrough in energy that future generations can compare to any of these significant events in history. But this time, it's happening in our lifetime. It's not a done deal. It still needs a lot of work, but you should consider how you can contribute. Make this your legacy. So what is the problem? Well, we need to fix both the climate crisis and also the nature crisis. We need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And at the same time, we must do that without causing damage to nature or ecosystems. Uh, we also need uh, to have sufficient energy at the price that people can afford, not only for the few and wealthy, but for all of humankind. This is an energy trilemma. And to fix this, we need an uh, energy transition globally. The energy transition, that should restructure the energy system to deliver sufficient and affordable energy with a reduced CO2 emissions. And many good solutions are being developed and deployed at present. I mean, wind, solar, hydropower, carbon capture, utilization and storage, just to name a few. And we need to continue that. But even so, success is not guaranteed. Some solutions have serious drawbacks. For instance, market acceptance and global scaling is limited by too high of a cost. And the increased need for a new transmission line due to a long distance between the energy producer and the end user. And also extensive land use puts pressure on nature, habitats, and food supply for a growing population. And on a system level, high portion of intermittent renewable energy in the supply mix could lead to energy grid instabilities, blackouts with devastating impacts to societies. To meet the Paris Agreement emission reduction targets for 2030, we are too slow and too divided globally. And pushing for the 2050 targets, we are racing against the clock. This is a global challenge, and we need them to have solution that works globally. But we cannot do this alone. We need a balanced approach to the energy dilemma. It needs to come together, industry, governments, and society at large, if we're going to make this a fair transition for all. And I ask you to consider your contribution, because I consider mine every day. I get up knowing that this is the moment in history where we have the potential to change from being part of the problem to being part of the solution. We really can make an impact, and together we can shape the future of energy. So what could save us? Well, we need safe, unlimited energy, sometimes called the holy grail of energy, fusion energy. There is a joke saying that, well, fusion energy is 30 years out and always will be. Well, I think the recent progress and ongoing plans will prove that joke to be wrong. And even if we're close to a breakthrough, the success is not guaranteed. But I have never seen any technology with a greater potential for humankind. So you have probably seen Chernobyl and Fukushima, images of that, nuclear power disasters. That was nuclear fission technology, and not what I'm proposing here. Nuclear fission creates energy when a chain reaction, from a chain reaction in which an atom, a large atom, is split into two or more smaller ones. And even if improved and safer fission reactors also could be a part of the solution to the climate crisis, it's important to understand that fusion energy is fundamentally different to nuclear fission. So what is fusion energy? Well, 
Fusion is the process that powers the sun and the stars in the universe. In that sense, you might say that it's the universe's preferred method of converting matter into energy. But reproducing that process on Earth is technically challenging. Fusion energy uh, creates energy when, when two or more lighter atoms are joined in to a, a larger one. And the end product of the, of the fusion process is helium, which is an inert gas, and large quantities of energy. And unlike fission, fusion is not a chain reaction. It has no meltdown potential and no long-lived nuclear waste. Even if the process itself does create uh, nuclear waste, irradiated components from inside the fusion machine could, would need replacement. Such intermediate and low-level waste could be handled using existing procedures that are similar to hospital waste. And unlike fission, the fusion process does not create any weapons-grade material. This is important in itself, but could also ease global implementation of fusion and industry scaling. But why should we want fusion? Well, fusion has the potential to be a base load of heat and power to society. And it's not low carbon, it's zero carbon. Fusion energy is dispatchable. By that, I mean that there's the, it has the ability to adjust the energy production to the customer need. And fusion also has an inexhaustible fuel supply. The fuel is readily available on Earth. Deuterium that you find in seawater combined with lithium. And you only need small quantities to generate significant amounts of energy. Just to give you an example, if you take your laptop and take the lithium content in your laptop, and you fill your bathtub at home with seawater, the, the naturally occurring uh, deuterium in that seawater, and you combine those as fuel into a fusion machine, you will have sufficient fuel to provide all the energy needed for the entire lifetime of an average European. So the process is extremely efficient on resource use. It's four million times more efficient than burning fossil fuel. Because of this, the running cost could become low. Yet another thing, fusion could take geography out of the energy equation. It doesn't matter anymore if you have petroleum resources, or if the wind is blowing steady and strong, or if you have a waterfall that you can turn into hydropower. Fusion could bring reliable energy when and where you need it in your local grid. That could circumnavigate power transmission issues and thereby also transform energy markets. In this way, fusion also could uh, improve the energy security for people and societies. For some nations and regions with petroleum and coal-based economy, such a shift could have a profound impact. And at the same time, nations without such natural resources could get an important opportunity. A fair energy transition is characterized by equal opportunities for all. Fusion energy could be a catalyst for that. So I sometimes refer to fusion as democratization of energy. So what does fusion look like? Well, there are several different approaches to fusion. In fact, 98 fusion machines are operating worldwide. And the fusion community is closely monitoring progress and merit of all approaches, both existing and new designs. Well, take fusion by magnetic confinement as an example. One approach is using a magnetic bottle called a tokamak to create the needed conditions for fusion. And you need strong magnets surrounding the fusion machine to make that happen. A, it's a really promising solution that could become commercial earlier than you expect. And here you see that a sketch of such a fusion machine. Now, what I would like for you to focus on is that out of the fusion machine comes heat, high temperature heat that you can convert and use for whatever purpose you want. An example shown here is with electricity generation and industrial heat applications. And rest assured, I'm not talking about cold fusion that you might have seen in science fiction movies, like the heart of the Iron Man or the end, you know, the back to the future time traveling DeLorean car. This is not sci-fi. 
but its high temperature, backed by seven decades of research and experiments, published and peer-reviewed by scientific communities worldwide. You might say it's science, but it's not fiction. So why don't we use it already? Well, to replicate this process on Earth is technically challenging. Inside this fusion machine, you need this donut-shaped plasma with the fuel to be sufficiently dense, high temperature, and confined. And you need all those things simultaneously and over time to make it work. And if you don't have sufficient confinement, the plasma cools down and the process stops. So failure means that the process dies by physical laws. So fusion is inherently safe. There is no chain reaction and no disaster, world disaster potential. Tokamaks are building on, on the decades of science, but there is something new. The high field magnets using high temperature superconducting materials are allowing now these tokamaks to be built smaller and more powerful and at a lower cost than before. And you can see a person next to the fusion machine over there. A breaking point with this is the potential to mass produce such machines in factories and ship them worldwide. Rather than having to build them on site, this could dramatically reduce construction time and increase the pace of penetration in the market. This is just what the world needs. Are there any risks? Oh yeah, sure. There are quite still a few, uh, quite a few technological challenges to make commercially relevant fusion machines run with a high availability. Topics such as tritium uh, processing, making that lithium into tritium inside the fusion machine, improved materials, molten salt blanket, these and many more challenge, challenges are being addressed by companies and research institutions worldwide. You can say that fusion energy is high risk from a technological point of view, but it's high reward from a societal and an environmental perspective. But I need more time on the risks and challenges. And that's another talk uh, I would need for that. So when can I charge my phone using fusion power? Well, proving not commercial, but commercially relevant net fusion energy before 2030 is likely. Some companies are planning well before that. And this could be the Kitty Hawk moment of fusion energy, where everybody understands, oh, this is possible. And after that comes the commercial fusion power plants delivering to the grid, and that is likely in the 2030s, perhaps even early to mid-2030s. Okay, so where does that leave us in relation to the emission reduction targets set out in the Paris Agreement? Well, fusion will not make an impact on the 2030 targets. And fusion energy could, if success continues, scale to have an impact in the 2050. But predicting this is hard, as fusion is so disruptive, and impact is relying on the world's ability and willingness to regulate and scale fusion once commerciality is proven. So what is big impact? Well, if fusion could provide electricity equal to 20% of the total energy consumption of the world, that would be huge. Is it likely? Probably not. But bear with me, just use it as an example to see what that would imply. To become relevant, we need to industrialize the solutions. How fast could we scale? Well, if we set up mass production of fusion machines in a scale like the production capacity of commercial airliners, take the two large, largest airline manufacturers in the world and combine their production capacity, and then you only consider the electricity output of the fusion machine. That is 40% of the energy that you get out of a fusion machine. How long would you need to mass produce fusion machines in order to account for that 20% of the total global energy consumption? Well, you need seven years. Seven years of mass production. So if you want to be ready for 2050, you need to build and be ready with mega factories building fusion machines by 2043. And before that, you would have to gain sufficient operational experience from the first commercial fusion machines, do design modifications, consolidate solutions and supply chains, and be ready for mass production. And before that again, you would have to close the remaining technological gaps. 
The World Energy Outlook by International Energy Agency does not account for any contribution from fusion energy in its projections. Fusion at this scale could help bridge the gap between the stated policy scenarios and the net zero scenario in 2050. It is more than what is needed to reduce the gas demand to net zero levels by 2050. Meeting such a timeline is extremely hard to do, even if commercial fusion should be proven early in the 2030s. This example is not a projection. Just the capital allocation needed would be massive. But it provides some perspective and a sense of urgency. We need to start now. This is what the world needs. Also after 2050, we should be willing to grab that opportunity, even at a smaller scale. It's a high risk, high reward business opportunity for the good of humanity and as a legacy for generations, for those who would like to shape the future of energy. I grew up on the west coast of Norway. And on the countryside there, there's a tradition that you should try to pass on your farm to future generations more prosperous than the state it was in when you inherited it. The same goes for the planet. We should leave the it for the future generations in a better state. We should take on that responsibility, feel that sense of urgency. So what answer will you give future generations who ask you, where were you when you first heard about fusion energy? And how did you make sure it became a disruption, scaled and changed the energy game for the better of humankind. Thank you. <laughs>